program, I thought best to warn you, is being performed in the nude. And if there are any children or perhaps uh, squeamish people present, we just thought we ought to warn you so that, uh, I mean, after all, uh, we feel it's only fair to let you know what's actually happening. <laughs> it adds so much. Of course, that's all part of the, the uh, you know, tremendous mythology. In fact, uh, I know, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a, a story around for a long time that one, uh, one of the famous lady authoresses of our time wrote all of her famous novels while she was, you know, totally dressed in the altogether. Gave her, you know, a sense of, uh, sense of life, a sense of uh, reality. <laughs> and uh, there, you know, there may be something to that. Who was it? Who was the writer who used to, uh, uh, who, what, what was the writer who only wrote between midnight and eight o'clock in the morning? And he wrote, a uh, famous uh, French writer, and he wrote with, uh, screens all around, like, uh, he had curtains, and he would sit there and he'd drink this wine, and, uh, he'd, uh, uh candles would gutter there as he's squirting away the ink in his, uh, his quill pen. <laughs> well, by the way, speaking of quill pens, uh, as a as an old jungle fighter, I'd like to give you a word of uh, a word of advice. I've probably seen I I would say roughly that I have clocked as many as uh, watching old uh, movies on uh, television. Uh, <laughs> and I would say, as an old campaigner in that world, uh, any time a movie comes on and you see this hand in the screen, the first shot is a hand in the screen writing a note with a quill pen. Turn it off. That's a Cornell Wilde movie. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a few other things, uh, too, that you get. Any movie that comes on, too, this is another word of advice, comes on, and uh, you see it's a tremendous big sign. It says, uh, produced by Sam Zlotnick, and there's a tremendous picture of a lion roaring, or there's a picture of a, a little tower, you know, and Ronica's little airplane. And then you hear a voice singing... Uh, uh, a little, uh, please, it's, it's, uh, no, a little echo chamber. It's Frankie Lane always singing like this. And, and there, there was a stranger who walked on this land. And then he said, ah! Turn it off. Turn it off. That's an Alan Ladd picture. And you, uh, believe me, if you get too many Alan Ladd pictures at one time, there's a terrible skin rash, which they have uh, already begun to write. They, they call it the Alan Ladd Old Movie Skin Rash Syndrome. And you get that uh, very bad, very hard to cure. And the only way you can cure it is by watching old Edgar Kennedy movies, which will produce another type of rash, which counteracts the earlier rash. Now, sp speaking of old Edgar Kennedy movies, uh, I got a note here. This is uh, discussing uh, problems of technical importance to all of you out there. It says... Uh, uh, Shepard, yeah, here it is. Uh, is it? Yeah, oh yeah, here it is. Uh, Shepard uh, says so last night on the 11:30 movie when comedy was king, they showed one movie segment about Buster Keaton being chased by every cop in the world. Hey, did you see that sequence? Any of you see that sequence? You know that sequence is one of the great comedy classics of all time. Uh, that that particular sequence, although like most great comedy classics, it doesn't come off as funny. As it, you know, as it does when the aficionados talk about it. But, uh, nevertheless, he says, uh, I'm reading, I'm reading the letter. It says, uh, uh he was, uh, chased by every cop in the world. And, quote, just take a guess, what was the fitting background music on this thing? Your theme. Ain't that a bust, Shepard? Did you, by any chance, see that movie once and decided that you liked the music? All right, I'm going to tell you the real story on that. You know, people always invariably believe uh, they, they, in fact, I suspect that most people give the egg, uh, the credit for the chicken. And, uh, <laughs> they do, already. The, the actual story of this movie was, did you, did you notice they had my theme behind that sequence? Well, in case any of you did, here's the story on it. Robert Youngson, who produced When Comedy Was King, and also, uh, uh a couple of other great pictures, one of When Comedy Was King, uh, what was the other one? Uh, great, uh, the first one, though, when comedy was king, and uh, uh, I forget the title, but uh, it was a compilation of great uh, silent comedies. And the first time I met Bob Youngson, who produced these, put them together, he's a, he's an anthologist of films, 
And uh, he's, he's probably the world's living greatest expert, and seriously is, on uh, silent comedy people. Anyway, one day I got a phone call, and it was Bob Youngson, whom I'd never met. And I said, yeah, he says, uh, I've, I've listened to you for a long time. And he said, I think you're one of the funny people around. I said, great. I'm delighted to hear that, you know. And uh, in fact, he even said some, an odd thing one time about that. He saw me do something in person. This is Bob Youngson. And he said, and I'm just quoting him here, he said, uh, he says, I could have been a silent comic in the pantomime. This is a, an odd thing to say, but I, I kind of took it for what it was, you know, a comment. But then he got to the nitty-gritty. He says, listen, he says, I want, he says, I think that theme you use is one of the most uh, uh, hopeless-sounding, wild, uh, bugle-blowing pieces of stuff that I've ever heard. And he said, I would like to know whether you would let me use that theme, your theme, behind a couple of sequences on the new movie he was making at that time, which is When Comedy Was King. And I said, sure, it's a real compliment. And that was used as a specific reference to the show, in other words, that, uh, that uh, theme was not only referring to the, co- the the Keaton thing, but he thinks he thinks that that sequence. That, now, now uh, this is a real behind the scenes comment I'm making. If you remember that sequence, Matt, you remember the sequence of, of Charlie, or rather Buster Keaton, being chased around by all the cops and all that. He thought that that sequence said visually what my show often implies about life, orally and. Uh, and in the various types of performance that I do on the show. And he said that he felt, he felt that, that, that that cross-reference would be very valid. But now it's interesting to see that a, a listener writes, and he says, uh, obviously, he thinks it was the other way around. <laughs> you see, he believes that I saw that thing, and that then I said, oh, gee, what a great theme, and I went out and I used it. It was, it was quite the other way. You know that almost every comic, uh, of, I'm talking about the great comics of the day, I'm talking about people like Keaton. I'm talking about people like Kennedy, who is, uh, I think, underrated. Edgar Kennedy. Uh, I think uh, I think Keaton was greatly underrated. Uh, I certainly, uh, for years, I was probably I, I felt like I was some kind of a slob because I kept thinking. I, I always felt and this is personal again. I always felt that that Laurel and Hardy were much funnier, and I underline the word funnier, than Charlie Chaplin, and. Uh, Charlie Chaplin, you know, he's got the he's got the uh, he's got the official approval though, of uh, of the well whatever it is the establishment that makes these people famous, and uh, I say sure he's fine, but I always thought that uh, Laurel and Hardy were actually funnier. In other words, you, you actually laugh. And you know, this is, uh, are you curious about uh, how this can be proven in an actual uh, work? That Bob Youngson, uh, who uh, has, has done these movies, he did when comedy was king. Uh, Bob Youngson. Of course, has seen these things thousands of times. He uh, he watches. Uh, I, I remember the first time I visited his apartment. It's a weird, eerie apartment he has in Midtown Manhattan. It's like a cave, and you go into the apartment, and the all the walls. Is, well, it's actually like going into a mine, and in a way, it is. He's got uh, absolutely to the ceiling, uh, and and backed out like feet, many feet from the walls. He has nothing but stacks of old film cans in every room. And you come into this apartment, and it's like going through a strange subterranean mine of film cans. And they go right to the ceiling. And, of course, they're all cross-indexed and everything. It's all silent stuff of, uh, you know, of the great period of comedies and so on. And he knows every guy that was in every scene. In fact, he will, he will, you'll, you'll be watching one of these things with him. And uh, you'll see somebody in the background just walk across the screen in the background carrying a shopping bag. You know, one of the innumerable extras that are in a scene that in the foreground you see uh, Buster Keaton running down the street and you just see people walking past him. Well, he will recognize every one of those people. He will point out which one went on to become a cameraman, another one became a used car dealer in Pasadena, and he's that kind of a cuckoo. So, nevertheless, uh, I one night had a, had a long talk with... with uh, with Bob about this, and I said, you know, uh, I felt personally. I says, I personally, as a as a humorous type, I always felt that uh, the, that Laurel and Hardy had a firmer grasp on humor uh, than Keaton did, or rather than uh, than Chaplin did. But Chaplin had a firmer grasp on tragedy. 
Now, there's a common misbelief, I believe, that they're two very closely related things. Not necessarily. Uh, <laughs> not at all. And, uh, and I, I, I nevertheless have always felt this. And I says, I think, I think you'll find that the, in general, uh, Laurel and Hardy are really funnier than Chaplin. Uh, you find yourself laughing at Laurel and Hardy totally unconsciously about, you're not conscious of the technique they used. You're always conscious of the fact you're laughing. Whereas you see Chaplin and you'll say to yourself, look at that marvelous thing he's doing with his finger. Look at that beautiful. Actually, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> that's like that's like uh, being very conscious of the way a painter mixes his paint and the picture itself you don't see. And so uh I I nevertheless this is a personal predilection on my part. Anyway, I watched uh, I watched uh, this thing over and over again with him before it was actually out on the on the market, before it hit the uh, the screens when comedy was king. And he took it around and they had sneak previews. And at that time uh, he, the, the, the connection of the films, in other words, where they were placed in, in context uh, in the entire production, was different than they are today. And he had to change it entirely. He said because he had a big Charlie Chaplin scene at the end of the thing, like kind of capping it all off, this great, fantastic achievement of comedy. And he said, you know, went on, and, and, and he'd sit in the audience, nobody knew who he was, and he'd listen, he'd watch the people and see what they laughed at and how they reacted to it. And he said, uh, it was, uh, you know, come see, come saw. And so one night he said he found himself laughing loudly at Laurel and Hardy. Just personally. He's seen something. He says, you know, there's some, of the, some of their stuff is so great, every time you see it, you laugh at it. And he says, I, I, I was laughing. He says, all of a sudden it hit me. His rotation was wrong. And so he put the Laurel and Hardy scene at the end, and he says, what a fantastic difference it made. He said the people would leave the audience roaring. I mean, they'd leave the, 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 the house cheering. And he said that he realized then that actually in an audience, just watching a film, that Laurel and Hardy really get through. I mean, they really make it. Speaking of unconscious comedy, there's all kinds of comedy. Then. And there's the conscious and the unconscious. Okay, all right, all right, hold it now. It's time to be official. Got to get official here. Now, all of you have been puzzled as to what you're listening to. You want to know who to write the angry letters to. Okay, this is it. This is W-O-R New York. W-O-R New York. And now, hit the money button. How many different ways can people express surprise? Well. Oh. Hey, there's more. Can you beat that? Ah, now that does it. These are only some of the reactions you get when you serve Michelob. Because Michelob is the one beer so good, people don't expect it. Bring on the unexpected pleasure. Surprise people. Serve Michelob. In the 30s, if you had $25,000, you had it made. But if you were an ex-con with $25,000, your life wasn't worth a plug nickel. Columbia Pictures presents James Stewart, George Kennedy, and Ann Baxter, three Academy Award winners in Fool's Parade. Rated GP, all ages, parental guidance. Yeah, now playing at Columbia Presentation Theaters all over town. And friends, that ain't all that's playing. Hit the button. Palisades. Yeah, yeah. Palisades. Palisades. That's, so that's the fun. Come on, come on, come on over, come on over again. Show some dancing. Show some dancing free. Shows free. the parking. Shows so the cheap. parking. Wow. Come on, come on over. Palisades on coast to coast. Where a dime by the most. Here we come. Palisades amusement park. Swings all day after dark. Ride the coaster. Get cool and... The waves in the pool, you'll have fun. So come on over. Yeah, yeah Palisades. A tree. It helps us breathe and cleans the air. Yet it is a perfect machine. Noiseless, non polluting, and biodegradable. For such a functional mechanism, a tree is beautiful to look at and nice to sit under. Help friends of Central Park reforest Manhattan. Nevertheless, uh, that that particular sequence, uh, that that Keaton sequence. You know that Keaton, uh, when when Keaton started, uh, if, if I can talk about the comedy ideas here and the way a comedy idea is developed. You know, I, I find myself often when I'm working on the stage doing in person work that you'll do something inadvertently. Uh, it'll just naturally come out of you. 
uh, you don't know where it came from. Just a little thing you do. You make a certain movement, and the audience will roar, and you, you're thrown for that minute. What did I do? What 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 happened there? Uh, how many of you are aware of what goes through the mind of a performer, especially a guy who makes people laugh, at the time that he's doing it? You rarely hear this discussed. In other words, you never hear, uh, say, uh, uh, well, Johnny Carson, say, he's talking to, uh, say, some comic, uh, Peter Sellers, he, or let's say somebody who performs in public all the time. Let's say, uh, oh, Jackie Leonard. What do you think about when you're up on the stage and the people are laughing? <laughs> you know, what, what, the, what does it feel like? You ever wonder about that? Well, it's, it's, it's an odd experience. Uh, but, of course, when you're a professional, you're, you are a professional. And it's very different from what people think it is. But people think that a comic up on the stage is, is, of course, naturally just having a groovy time. He's up there laughing it up, see. And he's, uh, he's laughing it up like they're laughing it up. Well, that's like uh, believing that if you go to a ball game... That let's say uh, let's say Ron Swoboda is enjoying the ball game as much as you are. Well, now is he or isn't he? He may be enjoying it far more than you are enjoying it, but for very different reasons. In short, Swoboda, or let's take uh, let's take even a better case because he doesn't get in that much and he isn't that much of a technician. But let's take somebody like uh, Roy White, who is a technician, who is a fine fielder and a real technician. You see, a student of the game. So White may sit back there in the dugout and watch stuff and see things and dig things that you didn't even see happen or, or even know were, were occurring. For example, he may see some shortstop out there make a fantastic play where he has to really go to his left, and he himself knows that the guy has a badly sprained ankle. And to go to his left under those conditions was a, you know, was a, was a tremendous effort. And you don't know it. You're sitting up there. You know, you're just watching this thing. On the other hand, he may also see a, a hitter use real stick work against a pitcher and uh, actually use the bat. You know, most kids think in terms of a guy gets up to hit, he just swings at the ball. The ball comes and he swings at it. Well, hitting is as much a technique, if not more, than pitching. And so so you'll find a hitter up there will be experimenting against He'll, he'll try all kinds of things when a pitcher is doing a certain thing on a certain night. And Roy White may sit back there and watch this. He may, he may watch the guy shorten his swing a little bit. He may watch a guy uh, step in a bit. He may watch a guy uh, uh, lengthen his swing, open up his swing, do all kinds of things against the pitcher. And, the, the, you know, the average viewer just thinks the guy's up at bat. You know, there he is up at bat. He's swinging a bat. And uh, so he sees these things. Well, a comic... If you're if you're interested in how a comic thinks, uh, and and in this case I'll put on my comic hat, uh, how a comic feels when he's watching a comic work, he can see the wheels move, <laughs> and really can, and he can he can see him do things which uh, which he may think are great, and he also sees him do things which he thinks are bad. Like there are a half dozen comics that I think that are working today, uh, that uh, you know are moderate successes. Uh, I, I think I can spot flaws in their work that I know are flaws, just as a pitcher can spot a flaw in a hitter. Now, it's not so easy for a, a, a casual viewer to spot a flaw in a hitter, but a pitcher can. So can another hitter. And so, as you sit out there, you can see various things in his work that are not good, that you don't you don't buy particularly one way or the other. On, uh, and you know why, too. You can explain t uh, to an audience exactly why he did this thing wrong. What happened there? Why didn't you laugh at that point? Well, a good comic, you see, when he's working, never lets you realize that you were supposed to laugh at a point when you didn't. <laughs> In short, you may see a comic do something, and it looks like he's just talking at that point, and you don't laugh, and he knows you were supposed to laugh at that point. Now, part of the technique of a good comic is to never let you know that a joke of his has laid an egg. Now, on the other hand, if a joke obviously does lay an egg, and there's no question about it, then you work with that. Have you noticed how many times, say, a comic will get up on the stage, and uh, uh, let's say Johnny Carson often does it. He'll be on the stage, and, and uh, something won't go over. He'll say, hey, did you read that so-and-so, so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. And he'll pause and wait. Nothing. And then with that, instead of just going out, what he does is he looks off stage and he says, uh-huh, all right, 
Down the drain you go, Charlie. <laughs> That's the last one you're going to want like that, right? And the crowd then laughs, you see, because he's, you know, he's, 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 he's in a sense used the thing. And, and he's pointed out. But you notice that whenever he does get a laugh, he never credits the writer with that. In short, when, when, uh, when he comes up with a gag, you know, everybody laughs, he never says, hey, Fred, that was a groovy one. Let's write another one like that tomorrow night, you see. Being that when you, when you do get a laugh, that kind of big laugh, you rarely call attention to the fact you were trying to get a laugh. And you would be doing that. On the other hand, if, uh, if you don't, always find somebody else to blame. <laughs> if you can. It's not your fault. You don't want the audience to lose confidence in you as a, as a performer. You want them to lose confidence in the lights or whatever it is uh, else, but not you. Now, these are all, all techniques. Uh, do you find this interesting at all? When a guy is working now, I'll tell you what you might, might, might surprise you about this. When a guy is working out on the stage, he, he quite often will do something. This is the way acts are evolved, actually, an act. An act can't be created for a guy. Uh, material can be created for a guy, but not an act. An act is an entire personality. Now, they can, they can give you tips. I've seen people who do this, that work with uh, comics and so on. But you can't create... I can't decide tomorrow morning, for example, to be, uh, if, if I just wanted to, tomorrow morning, I think I'm going to be uh, Buster Keaton. Now, I may be able to do a, an imitation of a Buster Keaton, but you can't be Buster Keaton. And by the way, I think one of the, one of the, uh, one of the most primitive and, and to me one of the least funny forms of humor is the mimic. You know, the one that does his little bit where uh, he has Humphrey Bogart having a conversation with Cary Grant <laughs> and this kind of stuff which uh, some people seem to think is great, but to me is, uh, is primitive and on the, it's, it's roughly on the same level with pie throwing, which uh, I suppose can be all right to some people. But to me, you know, you get one pie, you've had them all. You get one little Borscht comic doing Humphrey Bogart and you've had them all. But uh, that's a matter of taste. Now, uh, very few comics, you didn't know I was so outspoken, did you, Matt? Very few comics uh, today, unfortunately, this is a fact, uh, their work comes out of their own, I suppose you might say, their own personality. Most comics are, are what they call material men. Now, what is a material man? Well, he's a guy that buys gags, simply and plainly. He buys material. Now, you can't imagine Laurel and Hardy buying material. I mean, simply because of the nature of what they were. That it, that, that it sprang out of their personalities, their thing, their way, their, their, uh, their life. In fact, when you laughed at Laurel and Hardy, you laughed at Laurel and Hardy, not necessarily the material. Do you agree with that? You didn't necessarily laugh at the fact that they were a soldier in this sequence or a sailor in the other. You laughed at Laurel and Hardy. But most comics today are very, very dependent upon material. And uh, if if a guy, and that's why they'll pay a great deal for it. Uh, uh, many a many a comic will pay thousands of dollars for one little eight minute bit, which you will you and it'll earn them that too, over and over and over again, many times. And uh, this this is a, this is the prime area today of, of many comics. So that's why they're almost indistinguishable. You can turn your TV set on almost any hour of on Sunday night, particularly uh, several, you know, and, and on any any one of these shows. And they're almost uh, interchangeable. Uh, there are hundreds of comics working uh, w who have almost even the same names. I wonder how many comics that are named Jackie. Uh, you know, so there are the dozens of Jackies. I imagine there must be at least 150 comics named Jackie of one kind or another, and they're almost indistinguishable. And they have that they have that same rapid that same that same delivery. You see. Which, which means that they're mere joke machines. These are, these are guys that, that, that uh, use up material and, and use it over and over and over again. And uh, they're one-liners. And they're, they're, they're built for a specific, they're created for a specific type of room, a specific place. Uh, on the other hand, there are rare comics uh, who embody in their life, embody in their own, their own being. I don't know why I'm telling you all these things, but uh, it is part of... Uh, uh, our time, and it's not often discussed. When we talk about writers, for example, we often just dissect the writer, and we're very conscious of the writer's background. So when somebody reads, let's say, Mailer, we'll take for him, for example, everybody knows that Mailer ran for governor, or rather ran for uh, 
for a uh, mayor of New York. They know all about uh, Mailer, and people uh, people follow Mailer personally. And so whenever Mailer says something, they relate it to Mailer himself, uh, rather than just the printed word on the printed page. Uh, I see no reason why, uh, from time to time, we can't go into a little bit of uh, analysis and dissection of other areas of performance. Uh, so you take you take a Sellers, a Peter Sellers now. Now, I've, I've watched Sellers work a great deal uh, in, in movies and, on, and, different, and, in that, and certainly in other areas, too. And uh, Sellers' performance, uh, like many other fine, uh, they're quite rare, incidentally, in this day and age, Sellers' performance comes out of his own view of life. Uh, and so no matter what the material that Sellers may have, no matter what the script of the movie is, it comes out Sellers. You know? and you, you, he, he, re- he represents and embodies a certain thing. It's quite fragile, that thing, and I suspect it's not particularly long-lasting, but nevertheless, uh, it is a specific attitude towards life. Now, when you talk about people with comedy technique, let's talk about pure technique here, who are people who are not generally considered comics, uh, but who can make you laugh. You know, the better the comic is, the more uh, the more unconscious you are, really, of the fact that he's trying to make you laugh. Uh, to me, this is the problem with most comics. I don't find them very funny, generally, because they're obviously trying to make me laugh. And they come out with that whole, you know, they come out on the stage all dressed up for it. The guy's got a jazzy necktie on. He's, he's obviously got a, uh, you know, he's got a, one of these uh, shiny suits they wear. And uh, usually the MC before says, "Now oh, here he is, the man that's been killing them at uh, Las Vegas, and uh, so on." And uh, in other words, he has to be all set up, so you know that he's out there to try to make you laugh. And uh, I find that type of performing not as funny as the kind of performing which seems to be something, and yet is something else entirely. This is quite rare. Uh, the best cartoon, for example, is the cartoon that is well drawn. Uh, it's, it's, it, he doesn't have to use floppy shoes. To me, the worst type of comic is the kind of guy that comes out with a little gimmick. You know, he comes out uh, carrying his flugelhorn that he plays, or he comes out, uh, uh, you know, wearing his with a big cigar. Or he comes out with whatever, whatever the particular gimmick is, or a big handlebar mustache. Uh, this, this to me is is uh, <laughs> is the lowest form of non-humor. It, it stems back really to the Elizabethan days. When the when the clowns all had to come out painted up like clowns, you didn't know they were funny. So, uh, nevertheless, uh, of course, uh, I can't. You can't fault people for this because, unfortunately, today, uh, most people. I'm I'm afraid today. You can't separate the comic from his audience, the or the performer from his audience. And it's my experience that, really, today, uh, audiences have a very, very thin sense of humor. That uh, the humor is not really a thing that most people have, because I think that we're living in the age of self-pity. I think most people secretly pity themselves. They feel they're victims. Uh, they feel that life has uh, passed them by. They feel that uh, they're being cheated. Uh, that's, there's a tremendous amount of self-involvement in the audiences. Do you, do you concede this today, Matt? The people in general feel this. And so the one thing that they can't do really is laugh, especially if they're the butt of the joke. And in the best humor, the audience is the butt of the joke, in the best humor. And so today what passes for humor is really making somebody else the butt. And so the average comic will come out today, particularly comics who deal in race, uh, quite often will make the other race the butt. Uh, and he, of course, is a simple, beautiful person always in, in the in the discussion, and and so ultimately, this is not really humor, but it it it, it becomes a, another form of comedy, and it could be comedy. It becomes polemic. Uh, polemic can be very funny. Now we're getting we're getting very uh, involved and philosophical here, though. But I will tell you, when you're on the stage working, that a lot of things happen on the stage when you're out there. When when you you're, you're it, it never occurs to people, I guess, that are watching you, and, you, and it shouldn't occur to them either, under the best of circumstances, that you are as much a performer when you're out there in front of an audience, in fact, more so, philosophically in many ways, than an actor working in a Broadway play. Uh, you're, you're acting, you're performing, 
you have to use the tools of the performance. And so when you're out on the stage, you're conscious of a lot of things. First of all, you, you, you're aware that, that, uh, that laughter may be spotty. And you're instantly aware then of acoustics. That ever, has that ever occurred to you that a, that a guy up on the stage is working with acoustics all the time? And so he recognizes that, let's say, over in the left part of the auditorium, everybody's laughing like mad over there, and over on the right side in the back, people are getting restive and they're starting to cough. Well, though he knows then he's doing all right, or else, you know, why would this one group laugh? Something is happening technically. And so he will work around on the stage. Many times I will find myself using different types of projection working in different areas, never saying anything about it, until all of a sudden I suddenly find that the audience on the right-hand side of the stage are now beginning to laugh. I'm curing the problem. And then, just by slight adjustment, you find the whole auditorium is with it. Now, at that point, you've cured some of your technical problems. Then, on the other hand, you have the problem, let's say, of sight lines. This is a constant problem. And so, as you're working, especially in, in uh, you know, certain types of stage, and so you find that one group of people is not laughing at your facial stuff that you do, and another group is. So then you begin to say, well, it's the lights. And so you're working you're now, now with lights. And all the while, you're doing your material, you see. All the while, you're working away. So when the performer is up on stage, he is performing on several different levels. He's performing one on the level of a human being talking to you, and then he's performing on the level of a technician using technical tools which you are not necessarily aware of. So then, then there's the third one. You know, there's, a, there's another area, too. And that, that area is uh, something beyond your control in many cases. Do you know that the weather controls, weather, uh, controls a great deal about whether or not an act will be successful on a given night? Do you ever think of this, Matt? It's a well, it's a tremendous factor. So here's what happens when you're working. You're up on a stage. You've got 2,000 people who have decided to come to see you, right? And they, they've obviously signified that they want to be there. They arrive, and just as they start arriving, there's a tremendous rainstorm begins. Well, then all kinds of things set in. First of all, they start getting wet. I mean, that's obvious. But then what's worse is they come into the audience. This is still in their minds, you see. And, and as, the, as this rain continues, then there's all kinds of little cross currents. Did I close the windows? Uh, <laughs> see, in, in other words, they're bringing in their private life with them. Uh, another guy says, oh, my God, I forgot, to, I forgot to close the back window in a car. Oh, man. And so all the way through this thing, and will, will the rain be over? By, will, we won't be able to get a cab. Instantly you feel the sense of, boy, we're going to be out here all night long. So your act, which is uh, ordinarily quite good and right to it, suddenly doesn't have quite the edge because there's been this problem outside. Then there's other things like uh, you, you'll be working on the stage, and suddenly you become you become very much aware of the fact that uh, the air conditioning unit has gone out, <laughs> and, and now suddenly people are starting to sweat. That you could see you could see once in a while uh, somebody you know with tremendous struggling. He's taking off his coat and he's opening his tie, and uh, the, these are all the things that that begin to affect your performance, and you're very aware of it. So then you you have to take steps in your act to uh, to correct that problem. As a matter of fact, what I generally do, I use the problem rather than attempt to surmount it. So, so if, if, if it's raining like mad out there, you see, and everybody's a little restless, you see, and they're, they're starting to itch, I, I suddenly will stop. I shouldn't tell you these techniques, but this is the way performers are certainly uh, the way professionals work. I may, for example, in the case of the rain, suddenly stop and say, wait, shh, just a minute. Now I'll wait. Oh, it's raining. And you can hear everybody, yeah, and they'll laugh like mad. Then say, yeah, you're taking, a, in other words, you're taking a recognition of the fact. And then you say something like, oh, my God, I left the back window of my car open. And, of course, instantly they all laugh because they did, too. The, the tension is relieved, and <laughs> you've taken recognition of the rain, and you've said, look, we're all in it together. We might as well have a good, here, good time here because my car is now washed down the drain and the seat covers are wrecked. The whole thing is gone. So let's have a good time. It's too late to do anything about it. So this, this, uh, this, is, a, this is a technique that is quite often used. Uh, and it has to be that way. In fact, I, I, remember, <laughs> I remember one of the, 
one of the worst nights I, I, I've ever had in a theater. This was in a play that I was in one night. And, uh, and, and due to my training as a single, the, uh, most of us uh, who are comics generally work a great deal. When, we, when we're almost always working as a single, so you have to rely on yourself. You have to do all these things for yourself. Uh, nobody's going to change the lighting for a single. And so when you're, when you're on the stage, you're constantly aware of things which the average actor forgets about. He doesn't want to be involved in them. You know, that's somebody else's hassle. But you can't. As an, old, as an old single, you keep thinking of things like lights when you're on the stage. So one night, Matt, I'm up on the stage, and this was a, a play here in New York, and it's a Broadway play. See? So I'm up, <laughs> and everything's going fine. And, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the, the, the first, the second act, right, the, right at the point when it's supposed to be getting very dramatic and be deeply involved and everything is being resolved, I'll be damned. Uh, out, outside... You know, Broadway is a, is a strange place. There's all, all kinds of people wandering around on Broadway, as you know. And uh, it can be very noisy, too, Broadway itself. I'm talking about the, the, the actual noise level of Times Square. The noise level of 41st Street can be wild. You know, in the middle of your great speech, if 27 fire trucks go by, or else they all stop out in front of the theater, you know, boing, 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 the bells are going, and you're saying to be or not to be. It's kind of a rough scene. Well, one night, I'm up on stage, and, and, uh, and we're in the middle of the second act, and this is such a strange thing to tell you, because I was playing in this play, I was playing Mephistopheles. I was playing the devil. You remember that? Now, that's important. I'm the devil in this scene, say. And I'm a, I'm a plain clothes devil. Uh, that is to say, I'm a, de- <laughs> I'm a devil in modern dress. You see, the premise of this particular author was that the devil can appear in many forms, and in general he appears in the form you least suspect. So I looked like the most uh, totally lovable great guy in the world. It, I didn't come with a forked tail or anything like that, you see. So here I am in the middle of the scene, and I'm saying to this guy, see, uh, who, who, remember, it's Mephistopheles. I'm talking to Faust now. I'm saying to Faust, uh, now look, uh, there's no, there's no, uh, I, I don't want to pressure you into this. All I want to do is help you here. And if you, if you'll sign, if you, if you'll give me this contract, and it's just a, I'll, I even remember the words, it's just a form. It doesn't mean anything. If you'll, uh, if you'll sign this contract, I, I'll make sure because I feel that you're, you're a person who deserves it. I'll make sure that you have all these things that you've always wanted all your life. Now I don't know how I can do it, but I'll 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 swing it and uh, and uh, all you've got to do is sign. And he looked at me and says, "What? What do I have to give in return?" I said, "Oh, come on, that's that's not important. After all, what have you got to lose? That's that's the way you should think about it. Think of things positively. I'm I'm not going to ask anything of you. Think of things positively. Here you're an old man. You're about to die. What have you got to lose? I will make you young, if that's what you want." And there's a long pregnant pause. And he's supposed to be thinking about this. And I'm sitting there looking very casual in my Brooks Brothers tweed jacket. I've just arrived to sign the contract. When all of a sudden, outside of the theater, I hear drifting in. Sinners! Sinners, that's what you are! Fantastic moment. Do you remember this old doll who used to be this very loud-voiced evangelist type that used to parade up and down on Broadway? Do you remember her? There was a fantastic. She had a voice like a like a calliope. I mean, her voice made Ethel Merman sound like you know a sweet innocent little whisper. You could hear this old gal for forty-two blocks. And the, you know, she she used to just shout this stuff out. It was always the same stuff. She used to say things like, "You are all sinners. I know. I can tell it. Look at you. Every one of you. You must get love in your heart. Who oh, you sinners?" And it's booming out. And there I'm sitting on the stage. I'm the devil. Remember that. And it's drifting in from the outside. And here's Dr. Faust. Well, I could see instantly all the people are kind of arrested. You know, they're beginning to shift a little bit, see? Because <laughs> this 
was, you know, it was, it was very noisy. And she's right outside the theater. She must have been right next to the exit door there. Had set up her little thing, you know, with the with the soapbox, with the American flag. And she's screaming bloody murder out there. See, just yelling like mad. Well, obviously, they're not going to be able to get out there in time to, you know, to, to, to save this scene. So I'm sitting there like the devil. And I start listening to her like the audience. See, I turn and I'm listening. And... It hit me as an old comic. See, I says, I gotta save the scene. So I said to him, I said, Oh, well, of course, uh, Dr. Faust. I says, uh, There is the other side of it. I said, Obviously, there are those who are the naysayers, and there are those who uh, tend to be wet blankets. In fact, uh, if you listen carefully, you'll hear one now. And with that, the voice said, You're, you're gonna pay me for all your city. The audience Flipped. They <laughs> and Dr. Faustus, taking the cue, instead of, you know, being the typical uh, confused actor, he took his cue and he said, well, that convinces me. Yes, you're right. I've been listening to voices like that all my life. He said, look where they got me. And the crowd applauded again. And with that, he takes the little, he says, I'm out of ink. I'm out of ink. Do you have any ink in your pen? I says, no. Oh, well, I did. Why don't you take a little blood? How about that? Let's do a little style. That's the act of the play. Why don't you do a, do a little style here? Why don't you take a pin? You remember when we were kids, we used to sign packs and blood and all that stuff, what, what, how great it was? And he'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why don't you take a pin, and then we'll just sign it that way. And there's Dr. Faust signing his name in blood. And all the while, Rosie the Evangelist is out there shouting to the heavens. And so <laughs> these, these moments of... Uh, using the outside world. The outside world can either impinge on your life or it can wreck it. Or, and incidentally, wreck it when it does impinge. Or, there's no such thing as an impingement. If you learn to live in such a way that no matter what happens to you is part of life and utilize that, man, you're going to win. That's all there is to it. You can't conceivably lose. I mean, like if your foot falls off, well, then what do you do? fine. I mean, after all, uh, some of the most successful beggars of our time have had one foot gone. And, uh, you know, you, you just use almost everything you want to use. If you have trouble with your stomach, learn to have a complete octave range in your burps. Get on the Ed Sullivan Show, get a marimba behind you, and the next thing you know, you can be making records. I mean, so, you know, just keep hobbling along there. Best you can do, keep patching it up. Get yourself a vulcanizing kit. To, you know, you got to work with what you got. You ain't got much, but you got to work with it, friend. That's all you got.